one again. Thank you for remembering that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy and Rose um, to give us an update on child care capacity growth. Great. Thank you, Sherry. Um, so at first, I I will be showing um, just some data information. Um, before I start with the presentation, I just want to like let everybody know that Erin couldn't be here today to share this information. Um, she knows it in and out. I am definitely sharing probably a little bit more of a surface than she would get into, but um, can try to answer any questions if you have any after. So let me share my screen. Great. So again, thank you for having us. And Kathy and I are really excited to share this information um, and um, review all these slides with you today. So, but I also, before we get going, just want to note that DCF really has an amazing dashboard on their website now with this data really that's been tracked like forever. So um, just kind of putting that out there for now. Um, we're going to share three slides. They may be familiar to you. Really, we've been sharing these kind of on and off since like 2018. So let's see. Oops. One second. Okay. So just a quick explanation of the graph that we're looking at here. This is the number of regulated child care programs kind of tracked since like 2011, 2024. Um, the light pink here that you can see is um, all the providers at no star, one star or two star ratings. We're really seeing fewer and fewer of these um, and more and more of those three, four and five stars. And here in the dark pink, these are the three, four and five star rated programs. We're looking at the percentage of the three, four, and five star rated programs. You can see that this pretty much has kind of stayed fairly consistent um, over here. Um, for the last several years, it's a fairly consistency, but I also really want to point out here, as you can see, that there is a slight dip right here in the numbers of um, the most recent periods. Um, it looks like there's a slight uptake in that. And um, I do wanna share though, that the increase in the lower star ratings doesn't necessarily mean that we have a declining quality in our programs. It really, there's, there's many other factors that are probably playing part. So we really wanna take note of that. Um, one of the first factors are that there are new programs, right, coming into the system that we're seeing, and oftentimes they're, we're seeing them at one star, or maybe they haven't even quite got a rating yet. So that we really need to make sure that we acknowledge that um, they could just still be in that process. And then um, they may actually be quality programs. They just haven't gotten to that point yet, um, to that three-star level yet. And then the other thought really is with the change with the reimbursement rates and the rates not being tiered any longer with that connection, um, we are thinking that some programs think maybe it's not quite worth it for them to renew at a higher star level. Um, many that have chosen not to renew at that three, four, like five star level, <laughs> They may not have done that, but they are continuing and maintaining that quality of those, those programs. So um, just because at this point they've decided not to um, participate, I, I, I do think that um, that they're con they're still having those uh, quality programs and and really focusing on quality. Um, we're really optimistic based on what we're hearing uh, regarding the quality incentive program and um, the change and how it'll come back. So I just really want to mention how important um, the quality is. We all know that in our programs here. Okay, so moving on, this graph here is going to show the licensing capacity that's been tracked since 2016 um, up till today. 
Um, this graph really is going to show licensing capacity, and it shows all the early learning programs, including school age, but it is excluding the after school programs. So the children that are school age on here are attending either home based programs, center based programs, and that kind of thing. Um, on the right of the screen here, um, you can see this is by age and how many spaces there are for preschoolers, toddlers, and infants, and then all combined. Um, but I want to point out, oops, oops, sorry. I want to point out here the red dashes that we have. And these red dashes are roughly the number that will likely need care in those age groups. And we clearly have no surprise here when we're seeing infants um, that we need a lot more um, availability for those infants. And that's not surprising probably to anybody that's on here today. Um, okay, so then um, we are going to talk about the opens and closures. Um, this is definitely a conversation that many um, people talk about. I actually just did a training this week and one of the providers said, I hear everybody's closing. So it's really important to get the information out that that's really not the case, right? We're, we are seeing some positive things. It's um, So now that we've had the second quarter, uh, we really had more opens than closures. Um, uh, and this information has been tracked since 2018. And the chart on the right here is the closures based on percentage of total number programs. This is cumulative. So you can see right here, <laughs> this looks a little scary because it dips right down. But this 2%, because it's cumulative, is definitely going to go up before the end of the year. So at the end of the year, we're expecting that number to be more like 6 to 8%. Um, so it will go up. Um, these slides, um, yeah, so these are the slides that we're going to share, that we've shared. And um, I know that we have more information to share about uh, First Children's Finance and happy to answer any questions. Now, go off. Oops. Find I see you. Matt has his hand up. Okay, I just. Yeah, I, I can answer. Alyssa, we do have information on family child care versus centers. So I can get you that if you're interested in that. We track it um, when we get the state reports, we get them about a month later and we do it on a quarterly basis. So I can make a note to send you that information. Do you just want numbers? Yeah, I'm just curious, like what people are opening. Is it that family child care yeah. homes are opening throughout the state or is it center based and uh, what feels then accessible for people to open? Yeah. yeah. Well, I might be able to answer a little bit of that in a second when I do my piece, but does anyone have questions for Rose? Um, Matt does. Yeah, oh, so I, I actually have two questions. Um, it, it would be helpful. It would be helpful to, to look at the slides in a little bit more, with not in this presentation mode, but where I could look at it on my screen. So I don't know if you were planning on sending them out. But so the the first question is about the second slide. There was that yellowish bar, and I couldn't really see what that was. So I was. I don't know, maybe if you send the slides out, it'll be more clear. The second is just a, a clarification question. On that last chart that you were talking about, uh, your narrative was confusing. It seems like you want that percentage number to go down. Yeah. Yeah, right? it's actually a good want, thing. If you it's don't lower. want it to go up. Yeah. You want it to go. So it's good news that it's going down, right? Right. Absolutely. So, so you had said that, look, this dip is concerning and it was going to go back up. It seems like that's actually not the case. You want the number to actually go below the center line so that that means you're having more openings than closures, yes. right? So, yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good thing. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for observing that. Yeah, we I hope it stays add, right down by the twos and doesn't move from there or goes even right. lower. Absolutely. Um, yeah, regarding sharing um, the information, I will absolutely let Erin know that you're interested in it and um, she can reach out to you with it. Yeah, great. 
Okay, I'm also going to quickly share, um, I'm going to talk about the Make Way for Kids Capacity Building Grant Program. And I'm going to start by sharing a map of this past year's grant projects. So bear with me here. Everyone see this little map here? Um, while I'm giving you a little bit of data on the first year that First Children's Finance administered the Infant and Toddler Capacity Grant Program, um, you can take a look at this map that shows where the projects are located. The red ones are center projects and the blue ones are family child care. Um, in the past year, we were able to grant out one point, uh, roughly $1.9 million in grant funds, and um, we uh, supported 61 projects. Of those 61 projects, 32 were to start up new childcare businesses, and 29 were to expand existing businesses. And of those, 18 um, projects were family childcare, the majority were startup, and 43 were for center projects, just to kind of give you those two pieces. So far, um, as of today online, we have 476 infant and toddler spaces and um, 275 preschool spaces have gone online with these um, funds. There are six projects that are still um, not yet online. So those numbers will go up um, soon. I'm just gonna stop sharing this. Oh, did I stop sharing it? Sorry. No? Well, not yet. Sorry, I'm not used to Zoom. I always use Teams. <laughs> yeah, it's Is still it, up, Kathy. It's still it's up. a little little red like yeah. tab. I can pull it down for you if you want, Kathy. Sure, that would be great, Anna. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so used to Teams. Um, okay, so this year I also am now just going to put into the chat the um I'm going to talk a little bit about the guidelines, uh, the Make Way for Kids project for this year. So in the chat, I am putting the Make Way for Kids guidelines that are on the First Children's Finance website, as well as a webinar that our executive director, Aaron Roche, recorded that talks about the, um, the Make Way for Kids project this year uh, for a potential applicant, um, goes into a lot more detail as to um, what we are looking at, but um, both of those pieces of material are here for you if it's helpful. Um, so I'll just give you a few, uh, uh, some overview on this year's grant project. Um, the projects that are invited to apply include anyone starting up a new childcare business or, um, or expanding an existing business. The primary focus is to add infant and toddler um, and or preschool spaces. We also encourage non-standard hours of care um, and maintaining, we're also um, interested in projects that are maintaining capacity in classrooms that may otherwise close. Um, programs are intended to support families full day, 40, uh, full year, meaning 48 weeks per year and 50 hours a week. Um, and important to know is that the projects must be willing to enroll children and families who are participating in Vermont's Child Care Financial Assistance Plan program. Uh, what is funded? Uh, minor renovations, including uh, changes to uh, space to support infant and toddlers. Um, items to comply with licensing that may include such as a fence or something that is required by licensing. Expenses incurred to ensure an inclusive environment and meet the developmental needs of children. Training the compensation costs for recruiting new staff um, and equipment and materials, as well as training costs this year for culturally appropriate care for children of all races, beliefs, languages, backgrounds, and abilities. Um, if you have any questions, reach out to our BDS specialists. The team is amazing and they can answer any questions you have. Uh, in the guidelines, there's the email for VT grants. You can send an email, anyone can send an email and we will look right at it and I'll get that and I'll um, send it to the appropriate business development specialist. This year we have a million dollars to grant out uh, and family child care can apply for up to $15,000, centers for up to $50,000. And um, the, there are three grant rounds. The first one, applications are due September 30th. 
They will be reviewed in October and award notifications will be um, sent out November 1st with the first um, grant payment going out November 15th. Um, and there'll be that round will have three pay uh, payments over the year. And then we will have another two rounds, hopefully. Um, the second round applications will be due February 3rd and the third round applications will be due May 1st. And all this information is in the guidelines. So, and then um, important to note, projects um, must be completed with, the project scope itself must be completed with all funds spent reporting completed by August 1st of 2025. And the programs need to be online by December 31st of, all programs need to be online by December 31st of 2025. So. Are there any questions on that? Share the word, please. We've done all the marketing. Um, now it's like we've um, put on Front Porch Forum. It's on our social media. And so we'll just continue to do that for, um, but we definitely had a lot of interest. I would say we had a hundred, we literally had, when I looked yesterday, a hundred inquiries. Some of them will move forward, some of them will not, but the word is out, so thank you. Thanks, Kathy and Rose, for that update. Is there any other questions? So, and um, Rose, if you, if you want to um, send me the, Send Anna, I forget who does minutes now, <laughs> uh, the, the PowerPoint, we can include it with notes if you decide that that works yeah. for y'all. Okay, uh, y'all check with Aaron first. Okay, uh, great. Okay. Thank you. All right, Don, you're on. Okay, well, just to share a little more news about the online application, uh, we had, I believe, five on the first day, and they're being processed very quickly. We learned on Tuesday we had an applicant who was approved by Wednesday. So it has really streamlined the process and made it super accessible for families rather than have to have paper. Whenever time I read the fill out your paper application, I just thought, who does a paper application anymore? Well, not us, <laughs> not us anymore. We've got, we have, as Sherry said, walked into 2024. <laughs> so I'm going to share uh, the quality and capacity close to being completely in stone. We've got a few more. You're gonna, when I talk about some of the per child rates, those might fluctuate slightly um, based on some final formulas that our data team is working with us. So, you know, you might see like it's a $70 per child. It may end up being $80. It may end up being 65. It's not going to really move dramatically. We're just working those final calculations. And Janet won't be able to join us for the second part, but Chris Case will join us for the update on the communications. So let me just share. There we go. Yes, that's what I want. Okay, let me put it into presenting so you don't have to see ridiculous back screen. Okay. So, we presented this to a group of partners um, uh, maybe two weeks ago. I can't recall. I had COVID in between, so things got real fuzzy. <laughs> that was my first time having COVID. So I made it four and a half years. But uh, Washington, D.C., Sharon, it took me down. Sharon and I were in D.C. at NACI together and... I don't know. I got it. In, I got it in DC somewhere. All right. So here is our child care quality and capacity incentive program. Um, you're going to see our charge, our criteria, our proposed design, our development process, and the next steps that we're looking um, to undertake. So as Many of you know, this is the charge that was established in Act 76 for the Quality and Capacity Program. Um, and it was that we will establish this program to um, 
promote, particularly stars and these other high need um, points of, I can't even think of the word. So, you know, again, in, in increasing infant toddler capacity, maintaining that infant toddler capacity, um, establishing capacity where we have underserved population, providing those non-standard hours of care, uh, completing a commissioner approved training on protective or family support services, that's gonna be strengthening families generally and any other quality and capacity uh, criteria identified by the commissioner. And we will maintain a current incentive payment schedule on our website. So our criteria as we started to build this program was to be focused so that it's closely tied to that charge, um, equitable, so we're considering the accessibility and impact. It's feasible, so for childcare programs, it makes sense. For CDD, it's implementable. Um, and then like for our business office, how do we get the money out and um, paid? <laughs> You all know our, our grants and contracts. Um, <clears throat> I won't say anything more about that. And then uh, flexible. So we can change and adapt this as needed for future priorities. And that this is clear and timely. Programs know what to expect, when to expect. We know the field is absorbing lots of changes between the rate changes and eligibility changes coming up. There's been a lot thrown at the field um, overall, the, the, excuse me, the STARS modifications and re reimagining. Pardon me, there's been a lot of changes. So we wanna make this as clear and um, timely and accessible as possible. <clears throat> so our proposed framework for the quality and capacity incentive dollars is that um, part of this money is going to be going towards technical assistance to help with that quality and capacity and sustainability. First Children's Finance is part of this um, section, this proposed framework. We're gonna have the one-time recognition bo bonuses. So this is going to include STARS, uh, specialized childcare and individuals professional development. And then we're, we're um, designing an annual quality and capacity incentive that looks a little like readiness, but I, it is not readiness. <laughs> I don't want to perpetrate that this is a, a monthly payment in readiness. This would be a one time a year, most likely in May, um, formula-based payment that's going to go out to providers uh, who accept CCFAP. <clears throat> so right now, our budget for the this proposed framework um, is about 50% the technical assistance, or excuse me, 25% technical assistance. Um, the recognition bonus is looking about 25%, and our annual quality and capacity dollars is about 50%. So we we plan on spending the bulk of the money in those uh, annual quality and capacity incentives, but the one-time recognition bonuses look like about 50 or 25%. So the biggest chunk of the money is going to go out in those one-time payments. So this is our quality and capacity uh, technical assistance supports. We're going to extend our annual investment in that technical assistance. So we're going to continue to fund SPARKS. So that will be our quality coaching and supports. We're partnering with Vermont AUIC on that uh, facet more capacity and sustainability coaching and supports uh, through First Children's Finance, which you just <laughs> heard about. That's one of the things that we are funding. And then after school quality and capacity supports with Vermont After School. So those are our uh, three main quality and capacity technical assistance partners. And then we're going to combine the quality and capacity funds with our CCDF quality dollars. Um, so that will provide additional support for Sparks and Vermont After School, and then our CCDF funds and state funds for capacity building are um, moving through First Children's Finance. 
So we've built some excellent systems and we want to continue to fund those systems so they can continue doing the amazing work that they're doing in the state. So these one-time recognition bonuses are um, focused on uh, these categories. So increasing star levels, uh, renewing stars. This is a new. Um, this is a new category, and this is as we were thinking about it. We were thinking about what Rose referred to: are people not doing stars because they figure it's not worth it because the differential rates have changed. So if you renew stars, <laughs> you don't even have to increase the star. But if you renew stars, you get a bonus. Um, so we we want to encourage people to stay in the system, uh, and then earning specialized child care status. So this is applying to folks who are not provisional to star a specialized child care status. This is for folks who have achieved a three star status and are new specialized child care providers. This is another um, temptation to uh, continuing in the STARS program and also for those two-star provisional programs to increase their STARS to three STARS in which they would get an increasing STARS bonus and an earning specialized child care, uh, st specialized child care status uh, bonus. <clears throat> Achieving level certificates or credentials is part of this one-time recognition bonus. This program has existed, but we have dramatically increased the amounts of those level certificate and credential bonuses. And then we may have additional categories that we um, define in the future. We're kind of we've designed some things, and there are flexible parts to this. So. While this is the framework right now that's being launched, there may be some things that um, are added in the future. <clears throat> so our one-time recognition bonuses are to increase or renew STARS, and we're going to make that retroactive to 7123. So with the reboot of the STARS um, system, we're going to go back and anyone who has increased or renewed their stars starting 7123, they are going to receive this bonus. Uh, it's formula based, it's based on program size and type, and these do need to be programs who are accepting CCFAP dollars as per the legislative <clears throat> mandate or uh, intent language. Ooh, allergies are bad right now. <laughs> Then we're going to have the specialized child care status, which is that one time incentive program based on program type. That will become effective 10 1 24. And I will say that the specialized child care portion, we worked closely with Jill Pearl um, to make sure that this was something uh, that she felt good about and that the specialized child care coordinators felt good about. We really heard um, their concerns that programs were dropping out because the differential um, was not, the rate differential was not uh, continuing to exist. And then finally, the achieving level certificate or credential, we're going to set these bonuses for each credential. We've revised the bonus amounts and the categories, and these are going to be effective 10-1 as well. So coming up fast. John? Yes. Claire had a question about the specialized child care status. Uh -huh. Is it for only when is it um, for any program when they renew or only new programs that are becoming specialized child care? Actually, sorry, it's for I would it's love a, to hear that, but no, it was for stars renewal. Um oh, sorry. Sure it was for the first column. Yeah, I just that's for stars. So I'm sorry, what was the, I was focusing on the specialized child When you talk, the, the column, when you were just in that other column, the increase okay. or renew. So when a program renews, is it just for like a newer program to renew? If, but if you, or is it for programs just annually as they renew, even if they stay at that star level? Correct. Even if they stay at that star level, they will receive a bonus for staying at that star level. Obviously this only, um, this only pertains to, um, folks who are two stars and above because one stars don't renew, they just exist. Um, and then specialized childcare status is only when a new, a program achieves specialized childcare status for the first time. 
again, some of these things may change as we go forward. Perhaps it looks like we need to do some different things with individual categories and we would adjust and talk about those <laughs> with folks before we adjusted them. Okay, so when you increase your star rate by program type, we're going to do this on a per child base rate. So again, we're following some of the uh, design formats that we used for previous programs. So if you are an after school program, you are going to receive a 50% or excuse me, a $50 per child. These are the base rates. Uh, a child care license capacity of zero to 59, $75. A child care, a child care, bleh, child care <laughs> center based license capacity of 60 plus, that would be $60. Uh, child care non recurring would be $60, and licensed registered family child care homes would be $150. Much like the readiness payments, we're trying to account for um, an equitable distribution of resources and understanding that family child care homes. Um, have a limited amount of children, so their per child base rate overall is going to be, um, they're not going to get as money for the much money for the base rate as a center based child care of 60 plus children. And then, depending on how much you increase your stars, you're going to get a bump. So I'm going to show this on the next so if you go from a one star to a three star, you're going to get a 100% bonus bump. So you can see here on this chart uh, what it would look like. So a current bonus, if you have um, no enrollment and you increase, or I don't know what, oh, this is the current bonuses. You increase by one star, you get 500. You increase by two stars, you get 1,000. 1150 and then I oh my gosh I have to keep moving all of you around uh $1550 so that's the current bonuses our proposed new format is going to and we've just given you some random numbers to do the calculations if you are an after school with um, an enrollment of 60 and you increase by one star you get a $3000 bonus or you get a $3000 payment if you are um, an after school and you increase by two stars, you get a $6,000 bonus. And then forward, if you increase by three stars, 9,000. If you increase by four stars, if you're a one star program and you go to a five star, uh, you get $12,000. And then this formula follows through on the other programs. If you are a, a licensed a zero to 59 center program, you increase by one star, you get uh, 200, uh, ah, 2250. <laughs> and this is all dependent on the amount of children you have. So obviously if an after school has 15 children, the calculations are going to be different, but the formula won't change. Um, and then let's look at licensed family childcare. If you increase, so if you go to one star, if from one star to two star, you get a $1,500 bonus. To two stars, let's say a two to four star, it's a $3,000 bonus um, and so on. So we're hoping that this not only encourages programs to stay in the STARS program, but it also incentivizes moving up stars by significantly more bo uh, bonus dollars than they have had previously. Don, uh, oh, Jen, yeah. Jen has a question in the chat. Will we need to apply for the bonus if we renewed our stars within the past year or will it automatically calculate and be processed? It should, we should automatically calculate that. So there, any of these are not necessarily additional applications in addition to your STARS. So once the STARS, um, so the renewals, for instance, we will do a sheet and we will send that to Vermont AUIC for them to issue the payments based on the renewals from 7-1-23 on. So it'll be an automatic thing. In the future, it will be when you renew your STARS package, depending on if you have increased STARS or you're simply renewing STARS, 
that will also be an automatic send to Vermont AYC for um, processing and payment. So there's no additional applications. Thank you. For renewing stars, so this is a straight renewal and not increasing. Um, this is also a per child base rate uh, based on our program type. Newly licensed programs will receive a one-time bonus that acknowledges their automatic participation in STARS. Although they're in one, they are one star when they are initially licensed, we do want to give them a bonus to acknowledge, welcome to the system. Let us tell you about STARS and that it's great and that you want to continue to be involved in this by increasing your STARS level, but we're gonna give you a one-time welcome. <clears throat> uh, the base rates for children on these, on the renewals are a, a bit different um, and you can see them here. And we've structured all of the per child base rates based on that tiered um, equity distribution. If you are renewing and increasing, um, no, excuse me, percent increase. So if you're, uh, sorry, <laughs> This is this gets super complicated in my head. So if you are renewing and you are renewing at a two star, you get a 20% increase to your base rate. If you are renewing at a three, uh, a three star, 30%, et cetera. And this incentive does not apply to UPK programs with provisional status. So we do have a subcategory in which um, newly licensed programs can also apply for something we're calling provisional UPK status. Uh, they have to meet the other requirements, but they're not at the three-star uh, minimum at that point, so or four-star minimum at that point. So they have a certain amount of time to get there. Obviously, we're collaborating with AOE for that UPK uh, provisional status, but they don't get a bonus um, with that provisional status. So they can't renew at a provisional status and get the bonus. So these are some examples of straight renewals. Um, again, with the uh, enrollment numbers sort of plucked out of the air. So if you are renewing at two stars, um, and you are a, uh, a 60 plus childcare program, you would get a base rate of $2,600, but because you're renewing at two stars, you're going to get this uh, $3,120 and so forth. If you are um, a family childcare center, your base payment would be 800. If you are renewing at a four star, you're going to get a $1,280 dollar payment. So this is this is the this is the category that simply asks folks to stay in stars. We're going to give you a bonus for staying in stars and your bonus will be larger if you are renewing um, at a higher star level. With specialized child care programs, um, these programs must meet the criteria for the specialized child care status, and they have to have a minimum of three stars. So this is where the provisional two star status has come in. We've we've seen folks who come in at provisional two star and they might not work towards three stars in the way that they had a, a plan to do so. So we want to really encourage folks to get to that three star um, minimum for specialized child care status. They're going to receive a one-time bonus. And then we're also exploring increasing the incentive for specialized child care. So right now there's a 10% um, there's a 10% bump on the CCFAP rate paid for specialized child care, but it's only paid for one the one child. Um, and that's, I think that's the way it has to be based on, we have a, a waiver from Medicaid. Medicaid is where the money is coming for that bump, but we are trying to figure out how to increase that 10% within the funding parameters that we have. That's our, that's our hope. And that's Joe Pearl's hope as well. She's very adamant that she wants to see a higher 
uh, percentage uh, bonus or add-on for those children receiving specialized child care. So currently the one-time bonuses um, are slightly differentiated, but um, licensed family child care would be 750. And then the all the other program types would be an additional bonus of $1,000. And this would be generated through a list that like Jill would be feeding this list for the bonus because she's the person who has the most current information about who is a specialized child. And that's coming from the specialized child care coordinators as well. So Jill, Jill's driving this particular bonus. So we also did a, a, a great deal of updating for the professional development. John, yeah. I just, I want to make sure Claire got her question oh, answered. Did I? Claire, did you, did she answer your question? I don't think no. so. Oh, <laughs> okay. I'm <laughs> sorry. Well, then you I get it. That's fine. I mean, I don't know if you want me to just verbally interrupt. Yeah, go, go for it. yeah I can't okay. see the chat. <laughs> um, but like back, I think it was uh, two slides ago, but you were laying out um, the per child. Yep, that one. So okay. there's a per child. Nope, the one. Yep. And then stacked on top of that is the rate, no, the slide you were just at. And then um, is that annually, the combination of the two? I heard you say like, this is just like a thank you or something for being in STARS, I'm paraphrasing, mm -hmm. but is that an annual thing? Each year when the program renews, they're gonna get that amount of money? Well, it's going to be at renewal. So some programs choose to renew earlier because they want to raise sure. their star. Sure. But my but question it is, it's not like a now thing. It's just an expectation that folks can bake in if they keep renewing. Yes. So from, from July on, anybody who has renewed is going to retroactively receive a bonus because they simply renewed. Anyone who has moved up stars is going to get the stars bonus for moving up. Thank you. You're, you're going, okay, yes. <laughs> I, I think that that was the question. Sometimes you've been inside something so long that you just, it like, yeah. <laughs> Can I ask a question on calculation for- um... Sure. Like, I'm, let's just use family child care. Let's say, what, like, it, what do you use for the number of children served? Do you do, like, especially retroactive, do you do it as of what they're currently serving? Well, currently we're, we're saying, oh, Lord, let's see. And I don't want to get in the weeds too much, but I think the one thing is it's really helpful for us to know these because as we're supporting programs on their ideas of like investing in their programs, we can come up with a value and yeah. say, hey, you know, what you might want to apply for Make Way for Kids is not eligible. However, you can think about how to use these funds that you will be yeah. receiving. That's a great uh, question, Kathy. And I, I don't have an answer off the top of my head, but I can definitely circle back with you and let me make it a note. Yeah, one of our challenges is that uh, our enrollment data is fuzzy. So it's, we have um, licensed capacity, but enrollment one shifts, but it's also, we don't have, we don't have a place in any of our data systems at this juncture that tells us what your enrollment is on a, a rolling basis. I'm actually talking with um, the Office of Child Care technical assistance folks because Maine put something into an app. And so I'm we're trying to figure out like, is there a better way for us to get that enroll like enrollment data in, in realer time than simply having it in BFIS and it doesn't get updated. And you know, that's it's a challenge. So we understand the limitations of our data system and would definitely like to build something that's more responsive and nimble and accurate. So that's a partial answer to that. Let me get, okay. 
So um, our current bonus structure for the professional development bonuses hasn't been updated in 20 years. So it was time, more than time for us to take this on. And we've increased all of the bonuses and we've added a couple of categories into the bonus um, matrix. So you can see here that we have the recommended incentives. So what we are recommending for these. And then next to that is the current incentive. So um, we want to make sure that we are continuing with our categories as, as they are, but also bumping it up. Um, if you get, if you complete after school essentials, it's a, th we would say it's a $300 bonus up from a $100 bonus. Um, if you get the AS, the after school professional credential, it's a $1,200 bonus versus a 500. Um, and then you can see the level certificates in particular have, have risen quite a bit, um, up from $500 to $1,200. And in some cases for a level four certificate, you know, a $3,000 bonus up from a $1,200 bonus. So we we really want to encourage people not only to pursue um, enhancing their credentials, but also applying and letting us know they have those credentials. This is going to help us with our data about the workforce because we're going, we're incentivizing people to engage in the credential system so that we can see uh, more clearly our workforce. We've also changed, for instance, the program credential steps. We find that folks kind of fade out after step one or step two. And so we are giving um, some bonuses. The previously, there were no bonuses for completing the steps, but now we've got uh, the $900 bonuses, but you get a $3,000 bonus when you finish the after, or excuse me, the director credential sequence. So that is um, up. We've also uh, raised the AOE educator educated licensure bonus. So that's for folks in regulated programs, UPKs. Um, we've added that after school and youth work certification. That's a new um, bonus. And then the lead micro credential has risen from twenty $250 to $1,600. So we're we're invest. We're we're really trying to encourage folks to advance their credentials and tell us about them so that they can be compensated. It doesn't cover the full cost of of education or credential, but it's it's a nice it's a nice little gift. I know I shouldn't ever call things gifts, but bonuses, <laughs> incentives. And then the rest of the money, uh, that 50%, we are going to be doing annual payments. <clears throat> Claire, this is where our annual payment is going to come in. And then we're going to allocate the remainder of any of the quality and capacity money into this once a year payment. And the reason we did this this way, it was it allows us to recoup any money that hasn't been spent in the bonuses or the STARS renewal bonuses, renewal level bonuses, um, so that we're spending the totality of the $10 million. We don't wanna have funds lingering at the end of the year because we're going to get another $10 million to spend. And I can assure you that Janet and I are committed to spend spending down every last dollar of an appropriation that we receive. Um, so this is going to be to all regulated programs that accept CCFAP. And we're going to consider um, consider points that we also utilized in readiness. So there'll be more uh, for higher star levels. If you have a specialized childcare status, there will be a bump. If you're serving infant toddlers, there will be a bump. And then we've got some definitions we're still working on. So are you offering non-standard hours? So that's you know before eight or after 6 p.m. Um, are you extend? Are you offering extended hours? So you know, forty five hours or or more. Are you offering care in a a, 
a section of the state that is a high need area or are you serving higher need children? Uh, these are some, we haven't quite formal, formalized, uh, we haven't quite formalized this formula uh, quite yet. So this is, this is the one that's still the most in progress. But as soon as we have it set, we will let folks know. And then our implementation of this is going to be it's a very simple application. And we want to use as much administrative data as possible from our end. Um, we don't want to have even the readiness programs were, you know, it was a bit of a longer application. We want something very simple. We, um, we got permission from our financial folks that we are going to do much like readiness. We are going to do um, a, a beneficiary payment that just goes straight out and into any ACH um, accounts or via check if that's the way the provider prefers to be paid. And then we're just going to make sure that we, simple, we supplement this if there's any additional extra funds that we have to spend. So this is kind of the biggish payment that will go out to everyone, including One Star programs. So we want to encourage One Star programs to continue offering care, uh, but also perhaps to incentivize them to increase their STARS level, perhaps increase their hours so that their, um, one, their yearly bonus would be larger. <clears throat> Oh, we took out the, Ray must have taken out one of the slides. <laughs> it was just the implementation timeline. That's that's the only, you know, it wasn't anything super exciting. It was like, we will do this by then. We will do this by then. So. so am, Ashley yeah. um, Bissett had a question about professional development incentives retroactive in any way. Um, actually, I just talked to Janet about this and yes, we intend them to not have a limit. Um, so if you received five years ago a bonus, but you've increased your credential, just we you just we just need to know. And that, that will go through Northern Lights. I feel like I'm not speaking completely accurately, so I would like to double check my answer on that. I see Matt. Yep, Matt has a question. Yeah, I, so have, Don, uh, if, I have two questions. Um, let me just say, Matt, just one sec. Don, if you double check that and then get that to Anna, we can include yeah. that in the notes. Yep, thank you. I'm just making a note. Great, thanks. So I have two questions. Um, one is a historical one that I, I don't know, I don't mean to be opening a can of worms, but can, can someone help us understand why the decision was made to not continue making these sorts of payments and supports directly through the stipend or the scholarship or the the payments connected with the child. I understand there was a there was a policy change that was made, but I don't recall the reason why. So if someone could be able to provide that, that would be helpful. And the second question on a totally different topic is I appreciate that uh applications are available online. That seems like a good thing, but sometimes when that happens the staff support that helps make it all happen can get uh, off, you know, put off to the side. I think that this is online for the staff people who are doing the forms. Families don't do it themselves. So just clarification on that. But the, the first question I think is a much bigger one. Can someone help fill in the, the historical reason why we've made this change to this alternative ways of calculating how supports get to programs? So in regards to the online, it's going through the um, the CCRSAs or CCCSAs. So that's where the the applications are are moving through, and that's why we uh, the legislature gave them that additional money to sort of staff up for that uh, increase in both eligibility applications and the online applications. I just want to understand your first question. I think what you're saying is that we used to have dollars that went through the, like the CCFAP program directly based on the child. On the number of stars. So if you were a child in a five-star program, you got more tuition. Yes, that's an excellent question. Well, and that was 
the case right up through the differentiated rates. So this is this is calculated not simply on the children receiving CCFAP. So this is calculated, let's say you have a total of 10 children in your family child care, but only two of them receive uh, CCFAP. So by decoupling the, the additional dollars from simply the CCFAP children who are receiving CCFAP, um, the provider's actually getting more money. And there are a couple of things. That makes, that, makes, that, that makes good sense. So it's yeah. it's not... So it's not based on what kind of children you're serving. What kind? That's a terrible word to say. Yeah, the, I know <laughs> the, 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 the the distinctions within your 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 class, your population of, of students. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. about the service you're providing yeah, to the community, and that should be the way that the state reimburses mm -hmm. you, not what particular children you're you're serving in any particular year. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Thank you. So now, it, it's also an equity piece. Um, in terms, like a lot of states are looking to decouple that because often the most resourced areas have the higher rated, you know, the more resources. So the higher rated programs. And so it really, um, so children in those more resourced areas were getting a higher tuition amount toward their tuition, a higher financial assistance amount toward their tuition. And children living in less resourced areas that may only have access to programs that are at a um, different, a lower quality level, get less money towards their tuition. So it's really yeah. also an equity issue to decouple that and have all children have access to the same kind of tuition toward their. I will also say that Vermont is really a leader in decoupling our tuition rates with our a quality rating system stars level. Generally, when I'm with other states and I I tell them <laughs> that we've done this, they they are in awe. They they cannot understand how our legislature was able to think forward in that way. They've got a lot of pushback that you know money should be tied to stars and that star or you know whatever system that they're using. So. We are, I mean, an OCC is thrilled with this. The Office of Child Care is thrilled with this. Um, we're really one of the leaders to do this kind of reimagining of what our quality uh, rating system is purposed to do and how we can do that in a more equitable. In fact, I just sent this slideshow to um, our folks at OCC because they were so interested in how we developed this incentive program uh, to encourage folks to stay in our quality system and en enhance their STARS level. So we're really, we're kind of, it's nice to be at meetings with other, <laughs> other states. And, and and this is an Act 76 change and that, that yeah. was, okay, great. Thank you, yeah. that's very helpful. Yeah, thanks. And Jen um, was asking if you still apply for recognition bonuses through Northern Lights. Yes, that will still happen through Northern Lights. All right. So if you have any other questions, this was a big topic. So um, I wanna move on to Chris so we get to hear about that outreach plan. But um, I think we could save some time in our October meeting in the beginning as you think about all the information that Don just shared, Don mm -hmm. might even have some updates mm -hmm. in October as they're still processing some of this. So we will save a little bit of time um, if you have some additional questions that you wanna um, discuss in the ELD committee. And we will- It is a lot on... of changes. <laughs> <laughs> and we will move on to hear from Chris. Let's see, I'm trying, is he here? He is. Okay, um, awesome. He's trying to find a toggle <laughs> yeah. to get his video on. Hi, everybody. Oh, let me also change positions because uh, I'm too used to talking with um a window behind me and forget that that still lets me. But yeah, nice to be here. Nice to see you all. Um, and I I can either start talking about the communications plan that we're working on, or or I also missed obviously the conversation that came before I arrived. So if there's a specific question that I can maybe answer to lead with, I'm happy to do that too.
I think we're ready to hear you talk about the communications outreach. Okay, sounds good. So um, I don't know how much of this is familiar to you, so I'll give you high level and then happy to answer more questions. Um, as a part of uh, messaging CCFAP eligibility expansion, um, we are working with uh, an advertising company called HMC um, to generate an ad campaign that's going to go out. Um, and it's specifically going to message uh, that that eligibility has uh, expanded. And and then largely, I think it's going to be it's, it's going to be a combination of messaging the eligibility expansion and also just giving people kind of a baseline awareness of CCFAP because there may be people that just aren't aware of the program. So um, we are reaching out um through right now we're in the process of developing messaging so we have some draft uh draft messaging and also draft um commercials that uh hmc has put together for us and we're we're currently workshopping those with our um office of racial equity in the state we got some feedback from them last week that that we are currently working through and trying to incorporate into the ad campaign uh, this whole thing is happening on a very tight timeline. I should say that too. It's it's right now where we're working on the messaging with the anticipation that we're going to be get every, getting everything shot, all the commercial shot in the next couple of weeks. And then the ad campaign we hope is going to launch in the second week of October, like October 14th-ish. Um, and so um, right now, again, we're in the process of like working with ORE to the Office of Racial Equity to get some feedback about how... Uh, how we're representing Vermonters and our messaging in the campaign. Part of the eligibility expansion, as people know, I think, is that we're uh, it, it is going to be newly available the program to to um, new Americans and uh, to some un undocumented immigrants in the way that it wasn't in the past. So we're just trying to make sure that, like, as we're putting our messaging together, that we're um, representing those populations in our campaign to the degree that we can, and that we're really being intentional about like who we partner with to help communicate the messages. Um, and so, yeah, that's what we're in the middle of now. I think we're um, anticipating that's going to go out um, through a combination of print media that's going to be distributed to our, our providers and to probably eligibility specialists and maybe some CIS partners, other people that work directly with parents, families, and, and, uh, and can help get the messaging out. We also are anticipating that we're going to be connecting with some organizations, at least in Chittenden, that serve our, refu our, our, our refugee population to see if there are maybe other ways that we can connect with that, that population. Um, but these are all things that are kind of in the planning stages now. So I don't have too many details to share other than that we're in the process of like like trying to pin down hard numbers for how many printed materials we need and, and how we're going to get those out to people and um, still need to also look up some of the organizations that we want to partner with and 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 organize that effort with HMC to make sure like uh, part of it is like making sure that we're connecting, but also it's like, are we connecting or is HMC connecting? Like trying to figure out whose role, whose role it is to do what in this campaign. Um, and then the other thing that I will throw in is that there's... Um, in addition to that HMC ad campaign, we're also partnering with the Vermont Language Access Project to do a series of um, education videos that are going to explain regulated child care, explain the CCPAP program, and that are going to be doing that in, in different languages. Um, so uh, that is something that's happening parallel to the HMC campaign. I don't know timetables on those, um, but I know that we're doing them <laughs> and that they're currently in progress. That's happening through our CCPAP team, so I'm, I'm not as closely involved in that piece. Um, and the only other thing I'll throw out before I, um, pause is that, um, we are trying to, uh, make sure that we're communicating out that, that everything that we make now is going to be available for translation upon request. We've identified with ORE, the Office of Racial Equity, um, the top five, we believe, uh, languages that are spoken in the state, um, out, uh, 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 that, that are in English and and um, we want to translate the resources that we make into those languages as a baseline. We've also worked with our data people to, to just kind of, because ORE is giving us language that ref re like reflects statewide um, um, translation services needs. And we're just working with our data people to make sure that like, how does this then reflect what we know about our families and the people that, that are taking advantage of the CCPAP program. So um, we are, Going to be translating everything we make into that set of languages as, as the baseline, but also we're going to be trying to push messaging that other translation and language accessibility services are going to be available to people upon request. So that's um, a lot happening. It's, we're very midstream right now, so I don't have like copies of you know 
uh, posters or, you know, printed materials to share with you. I don't have a commercial to, to throw to, but that's, you know, this is kind of where we are given the timing of this meeting. So I wanted to share what we have and happy to take questions and also happy to come back in a month or so and, and give an update if that would be helpful. Thanks, Chris. Does anyone help her? Oh. oh, that's a good point, Kathy, to learn what top languages are sp spoken in Vermont for other work and how that can be utilized. That's a good point for sure. Can I jump on to that comment? Chris, I have up. a question. Yes, go for it. Um, so I asked that in a different BBF meeting that I was in, um, and the Office of Racial Equity actually has those numbers of the top languages um, and the translations and all the connections for making those happen. So it, it exists. We don't have to go look for it. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. And the number we have, I think, 14 languages that are already identified as like the top in the state. And um, they I'm sure they have more information that we didn't get. I, I know we had the languages, but didn't see numbers associated with them. We took those 14 languages to our data people and said, like, what can you tell us about like what people are speaking in, in the state, like the people that have completed those fields within our CCFAP applications. And the challenges that we're having is that like we the 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 uh, what is your first language of, of preference or like the language that you would prefer to receive information and in. that's something that's an optional field and so we have a lot of people that just don't fill it out or that right other because we also don't have in our um uh bfis system like we have some languages for people to check boxes in but then we have other to represent a lot of other you know languages and that's not really informative to us obviously you know when we're trying to be be concrete about what we're printing things up in so yes, thank you. There is more information from ORE. We're trying to crosswalk it with what we have and also like are, are ultimately going to just be available if anybody else needs anything in the language that we already haven't provided it in. Other questions for Chris? And Chris, you said you're gonna release, your plan is to launch a lot of that on the 14th of October. It's around there. We don't have a hard date yet, but it's we're projecting like mid October, and so I think fourteenth is a Monday, and so I I threw that as out as a date. But um, but yeah, right now we're thinking like mid October. We were originally thinking beginning of October, but we're going to be pushing things back a few weeks to get extra um, mm -hmm. extra input from Awari and to incorporate their feedback into the process. So I have another question. In the, so has there. Is there any hope at some point that you that there might be consideration in rebranding CCFAP? Possibly. Like maybe can can you expand on that? Is it do you mean the language describing? Well, I think I think the, I think some of us would say that there's just a stigma around a pro child care financial assistance program. Mm -hmm. And you know, similar to the way we rebranded Dr. Dinosaur. Um and just thinking about a different way of of um, offering the program so that it it's really getting at access for all. Yeah, I think that is messaging that we are trying to push more in, in what we send out. Um, and I mean, part of that is because of 76, we're just trying to frame this more as being a benefit, you know, than, than, um, than mm -hmm. anything else. And, and that's language that I know that Emily Hazard has used a lot in her messaging and her conversations with us. Um, I don't know... I don't think that it's gone beyond that. I know that there's an interest in in rebranding, but I don't think that we're in a place yet where we've talked about like concretely, yes, we're going to do it. It's going to be three months. It's just also very cumbersome. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because sure. it's so jargony. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so much of it is jargony. And then yeah. we always use the acronym. And so there's just a lot of reasons that it might be that. Yeah, and this I is, I'm it, just curious. Yeah, agree. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> No, I'm just curious. You said you're doing commercials. Are those like, are those going to be television, social media, both? It's going to be both, as I understand it. I we have right now the um, HMC, and this is like the downside of coming to you now. Everything is still a little bit squishy. Um, HMC has proposed a number of different channels, like to get information through television, YouTube. I think was one that they they pushed out, and they also said they were considering other options. So what we've done so far is budgeted, you know, X number of dollars to to distribute the commercials through 
And then, you know, we're going to be hearing from them about like more concretely, like where are things going? We're anticipating a combination of uh, TV, radio and, and social media and YouTube is the one that they've really um, hit on as, as a social media outlet. Yes, we can talk a lot more. Hi, Hi. Uh, Sarah yeah. from Chad. Oh, hey, we can wonderful. talk a lot more tomorrow, but we um we got some um feedback for you. We'll share it with you tomorrow in our meeting. But we got especially from New Vermonters, so um we heard some helpful insights that will hopefully help this um you know the New Vermonter um issue and language and some some confusion around CPAP too. So happy to help support you in in this, and we can share a lot more details tomorrow. But we did get some really great insights from from some of those families. That's, That's great to hear. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. My internet's unstable, so I've turned off my video, but Lori, I can barely see your hand raised with your, it matches your background. <laughs> Go for it. Sorry about that. No worries. That's too funny. Um, and if this was already answered, I apologize if I missed it. It's just a lot of information. I'm just wondering, because I don't have a parent portal um, for CCFAP. I'm just wondering, is that information or will it be in the future available in other languages? Because one of the barriers in working with dual language uh, learner families is making sure we have the right translation services or interpretation services for them to be able to access the programs they need to be able to afford um, child care and early childhood ed. And, and I know when I click on the original link, there's no, there's nothing there that says if you need this in a different language or anything. And I just mm -hmm. didn't know, you know, what the plan was just on, from that, that viewpoint. So we can know what to expect. Yeah. And so I don't know if I can, so it sounds like there's a general question that I can answer that I might need to refer you to Emily for the specific ones. If there's like a specific part of the website or a specific document that you need translated or service. Um, I think that we we uh, recently had an AHS, the Agency of Human Services, um, a new language accessibility policy that was passed. And so uh, the, the Department for Children and Families was trying to figure out like how it wanted to respond to those policies and make sure that we were we were in compliance there. And then there's a piece of that that also falls on CDD to make sure that we're in compliance around. So we've identified within CDD that we really don't have that notification on the website, you know, saying like, if you need this in another language, you know, tell us. So um, we recently had our communications person move on to a different position, but we're in the process of hiring for somebody new. If anybody knows anybody, <laughs> please refer them to me. I'll be happy to direct them to, to where the posting lives. Um, but once we get we're that- We're a very nice right, team. To yeah, work. we're a nice team. <laughs> we, we, we don't bite. <laughs> um, and um, I think that one of our priorities when we have our, our communications person come on is going to be to look at ways to represent just that like translations are accessible um, and, and and available um, and, and to put that in every place on the website where we, we can conceivably do it. I think we're also looking at, um, eventually this is gonna be a down the road thing, but like we're trying to, to take all the translated versions of documents that already exist and put them on one page so that people have an easier time finding them and um, and then also identify a baseline of documents that need to be translated and, and move forward from there. So all that is to say that I think we're gonna be making some improvements over the next six months or so. But if there's some page or some document that you're not getting a version of that you need a version of, I would just reach out to Emily Hazard and she can she can help you to uh, to get that set up. Thanks so much. That's really helpful. And I'm really happy to hear all this because I know as a program, you know, we are held to a standard to offer all of our documents in the language um, for the family. But yet we, you know, in other areas where we have to access other services, we don't we don't have that for them. So it's been a a challenge. I'm really excited about this. That's great. And I'll just throw out too that, I mean, we're having our conversations about improvements, not in the bubble exactly, but I mean, you know, like we're, we're talking to each other, you know, our, at CDD about this. If there are requests or recommendations or ideas that you have in this team, I don't know the best way to get that information to me, um, but I would love to hear it. I think that we're in a place right now where like your input would be valuable and, and um, you know, it's early enough in the process where it could help to shape what we do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question in the chat and then we'll go to Alyssa. The question in the chat, do you see that Chris asking about if um, programs will have access to the portal to familiarize themselves with the application? I'm not seeing that, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll scroll okay. down. Let's see, many programs uh, offer support. You see that, yeah. Yeah, reading through it now. Um, 
I think that that would be, if I'm understanding this, is this a, a portal that's specific to CCPAP? Yes, when they sign up for CCFAP, we often help them with the paperwork. Mm -hmm. So is it, a, can we go in and see what the, the portal is going to look like to help oh, them go through that? And also does that application, the CCFAP application work the same on a phone, a tablet or a computer? Cause sometimes they differentiate. Mm -hmm. Chris, so, I think that yeah. it's in the B, sadly, it's in the BFIS uh, web site. And that then you have to click child care benefits and then it says apply online mm -hmm. so it's kind of, i mean you know it's kind of like a three click process but then it says start application and retrieve application but i don't know if you are able to retrieve the application yeah i don't either and i don't know if it's just the two of us don for cdd today or if, if anybody from the team this no, is here i think I'm, I'm sorry i can't answer that question but i'd be happy to take it to emily and and um Again, like, I don't know if this is something where Emily would be getting back in touch with you, Christina, or if that would go to somebody like an EL team, ELD team lead or something to distribute out to the group. Um, but I'm happy to to route that question to her and her team to answer. If you want to send anything to me, Chris, I'm happy yeah. to send it to the full list. Yeah, you got it. Thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. Alyssa. Hello. Um, I was wondering if after like the ad campaign runs, if there would be an opportunity for you to present like KPI findings of like what was mm -hmm. most successful in terms of reaching folks, um, which channels were most successful, what were the hiccups along the way? I think it'd be really interesting for everyone else in the state to hear what y'all learn from this from a KPI perspective. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I don't know when we're going to have that information, you know, because it's sure. still, still in the planning stages. But I, I think that would be um, be happy to do it. I think it'd be good to be good to share that out. Great idea. Meg is wondering if there's any updates on CDDIS and the oh. development of that. Yeah. So what can I asking? And this is something that I don't know, maybe, maybe Don or I could answer this, but this might be a question to bring to, to Carolyn Long, our operations director. Could you talk more about, about what you were hoping to hear? Well, I'm just, I, it was sort of in response to what Don was saying about, you know, you go here and then you go there and then you go through a secret portal that opens up into a new <laughs> dimension and mm -hmm. you have discovered what you need. Um, and I'm just wondering at what point that might change okay and um, i don't mean to be flip about it it's just, no, no, no 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 i don't think you you're, are at all. Is, you're yeah. right <laughs> yeah i mean this is this is how we talk about it internally too so um, <laughs> like don i don't know if you know the answer to that one otherwise i'd have to bring it to carolyn i'm not sure about timetable for some of this you know i mean cddis is in perpetual up, update right so you know there's phase one which was the phase that was launching the payment system. There's phase two, which is like workforce registry and other uh, licensing. Uh, they're both running simultaneously. But as Chris says, we're, <laughs> we are well aware of BFIS and its fragility. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes it feels like we're running against a clock with BFIS's lifespan. So I don't have like a solid update, but yeah, we know. So yeah. Don, I wonder if it might be something in a future meeting at ELD that we could ask Carolyn to come or, or whoever yeah. is the right person. Just yeah, it's Carolyn. It. <laughs> yeah. So we could we could put that on our list of ideas for a future meeting. Sure. And um, I'm taking notes on your question, so I'll I'll connect with Emily and Carolyn after this, and then wrap the responses back to Anna. Thanks for sharing your uh, your questions. Thank. So I think um, anyone else have one final question on any of this? So thanks, Chris, for the update on the communications plan. And I we're I believe Anna, you're up with our policy recommendations. Thank you, Sherry. 
Thank yeah. you for your presentation too, Don. Yes, thank you all. Really great information to bring to this group. Um, I am not going to take the floor for long here. I just want to circle back with folks so that we make sure that we're communicating clearly with all of our partners about what to expect in terms of the next steps for the policy recommendations. Um, this group has been incredibly helpful in the development of those recommendations. Uh, we are kind of polishing them, including going through a little bit of a copy edit process with our communications team internally um, and working to incorporate some last feedback that we're getting from partners. Um, you should have seen, I emailed this full group. Please let me know if you didn't receive that email on Monday with the agenda and a copy of the two recommendations um, that this group specifically has been kind of overseeing the development of. Um, so you will, um, the, that hopefully folks received. Um, this coming Monday, we will have the full slate of the policy recommendations available on our website and that will be sent out sometime soon to the listserv and state advisory councils can expect to get a copy of that in their inbox as well. Um, and we will have a survey that folks can expect to see. I'll make sure to send it to the ELD list, but it'll also go to the full BBF network listserv. Um, and that survey is a great spot if you have any additional feedback uh, about either the ELD specific recommendations or the recommendations more broadly. Um, we would welcome your feedback in that form. It's just helpful as it kind of triages and funnels uh, feedback into one centralized place for the team. So um, would welcome any kind of feedback on the language or framing. Um, as well as if you feel like there's there's something that's that's missing from the slate overall, that's something we really want to hear from you as well. So um, you can expect kind of that communication from me in the next week um, that includes a, a copy of the slate of recommendations and a link to the survey, um, which will be open for probably about two weeks once I send it to you. Um, before we we finalize the the draft that the state advisory council will vote on at the end of October. Um, so that is what to expect. I'm happy to take any questions, um, but we'll ask that that feedback get sent to me uh, via email uh, or through that survey once it's made available. Any questions for? Anna, about this, the policy recommendations and the process and timeline. Okay, great. Anna, do you have this? Are we able to put the survey link in? Yes. So, as I said at the um, beginning of the meeting, every couple of years we um, look at the ELD membership and want to confirm uh, the membership of ELD. Also in the survey, there is a space, as I recall, uh, we created it a couple months ago, um, but a space that if you are thinking about roles that are missing or individuals that we should reach out to to join the ELD committee, that would be great. So what we're asking for is um, for you to fill out the survey, indicate your interest. Again, member, we try to have different roles represented at ELD um, and different geographic areas as well. So both of those. And what we're asking for is your continued interest if you're already on ELD or interest if you're not on ELD, but you're interested in being uh, a more formal member. And typically what that is, is a commitment to really be engaged in the meetings, to attend the meetings, engage in the meetings. And uh, so we have that continuity when we're looking at policy recommendations or other infrastructure needs um, that we have that continuity of people that have been looking at it across time. So if you could click on that now and take a couple minutes. Is it fixed? Are people able, able to get able access? To ask. Yes. All right. So we're going to like just give you three or four minutes to work on that and then go over uh, some updates 
and a few action items. So I'll give you one more minute and then we'll move ahead. And you can work on it after as well. But we wanted to give time in the meeting so we were sure to get them, um, get them back. All right, thank you everyone for taking a few minutes to do that. That's super helpful. Um, I have, I want to, I can, I can start with an update and then anyone else that wants to share an update. I think um, Sharon had to pop off, but I just, um, we've heard recently from Vermont AOIC and I just wanted to update everyone that the Office of Professional Recognition has posted the application, it's taking public comment, and there are public meetings next week on the 17th and 18th um, regarding the proposal from Vermont AYC um, for um, early childhood education to become a recognized profession in Vermont. So that's an update. There is a, a roundtable update from Vermont AYC tonight. They had one, I think, last week or earlier this week during the day, and they have another one tonight if you're interested in um, more information about that or hearing about that. Any other updates that people want to share? I can, Becca, do you want to provide, is Becca still here? Becca, or, or I can, do you want to provide an update on the um, UPK sure, committee? <laughs> on yesterday? Was it really only yesterday? It was two days ago, on Tuesday. Um, the, the, short, the short sentence is that we met as an Act 76 um, legislative, whatever, appointed body um, for the first time in person yesterday or Tuesday, which was absolutely um, chaotic, as you would expect, and wonderfully beautiful. Um, so we looked at the uh, draft that is out. 
Um, I can drop it in the chat in a minute. The first draft is out. Uh, it went public Friday a week ago. Um, and we pleasantly destroyed it um, in the meeting, which was the purpose of the meeting. Uh, and so feedback on the draft from committee members will um, be requested by September 20th. I just saw that email. Um, and so kind of where we are in the process is draft one was our work on Tuesday. We're going to get draft two, um, which will be much more comprehensive and incorporate all of the feedback from our small group work on Tuesday. Um, draft two will be out really shortly before the October meeting. Um, and then we are in flux about if the October meeting is going to be in person or not. That was another survey that went out this morning. Um, we'll meet at the October meeting and add and focus on missing identified items and some language changes. Um, there's a proposal and a recognition that will add additional meetings into our calendars um, because it's such big work and it's so important. That's still in flux. Uh, we will meet again in November <clears throat> and uh, for draft three, which will hopefully be the final, air quotes, draft. Um, and then the final report is due to legislatures, uh, legislators um, December 1st. Um, there are many, many interests, not all in alignment, um, but there are many, many interests um, and representations on the committee. Um, and so I think what I would what I would say publicly is that we are um, at those tension points, right? Which like we all knew we were gonna get there um, and in thinking about how to provide it. Um, so I would highly recommend and have been highly recommending that people engage in the process. Now is a crucial turn point. Um, engage in the process in whatever level you can. Um, the notes, from the beginning of time when we met um, almost exactly a year ago um, for both our full committee and our work groups um, are all posted on the pre-K implementation, the pre-K education implementation committee website, um, as is the report that we looked at yesterday or Tuesday. The report is housed in the September 10th minutes agenda materials. So you have to go one layer deeper. Um, any and all feedback, it is a public process. They are open meetings. Um, any feedback that people have, really I would emphasize the timeliness because um, we're getting to the you know final accumulation of reports. Um, public feedback can go to Molly as a facilitator, on the website, there's also a list of all of us as committee members with all our contact information and our roles that we represent for constituents. Um, and you are also welcome to attend the meeting and speak at the meeting or send written testimony um, or any of that good stuff. I don't think I missed anything. I. Matt, did I miss anything? You were also there. I'm just looking to see who else was there. I think it's safe to say that it's a fluid discussion and that um, the legislature's mandate is um, some both complicated and a little confusing and a little contradictory and that the group is trying to uh, it seems come up with a report that is um, uh, helpful and re productive and reflective mm -hmm. and to use the gathering as an opportunity to provide something that's useful to the legislature, uh, regardless of exactly how it addresses the questions that are posed uh, and that it's very complicated and that if folks are looking to in, have input from the outside, should probably seek out someone on the panel that they know and have a more private conversation with them to get 
perspectives, given the complexity of it, that it would be totally impossible to present in a situation like this. Not to try to hide it or make it be weird, but it's just too complicated for a large Zoom meeting for a conversation. I was, thank you. Thank you, Matt, for both adding that in. And um, several of you I've shared the report with, and that was definitely a piece that, um, that we talked about at the meeting was the report is very drafty, very drafty. It's beautiful. It's a great first start. It had lots of conversation points. Um, but it definitely, when you read the report, doesn't necessarily reflect all of the conversations that have happened. So yeah, Matt, I, I would highly recommend that people connect with people who are who are in it. Um, and Anna put it into the report, um, and I'll add the website in a minute. I think that's it, Sherry. That was way more than I thought I was going to say. I think that sounds good. And in defense of the report, I remember sitting like about a month ago going, I don't even know what I would say, so I'm glad I'm not ready for it. <laughs> so it was a very great it actually exceeded my expectations as a first start. If you have attended all of those meetings and the subcommittee meetings, it, I honestly at times just felt like at a loss for where to begin. So it's a great first start, but work to do. Any other updates? I wanted to just reflect some of the actions that I heard today. So first there was, um, just some discussion and interest and in, in learning more about the, um, the top six languages and how we might be thinking about access to those and utilizing those in other ways um, for to support families. Um, I think it was KPA, was that the right, um, when they have more info, was that the right acronym, Alyssa, from the, the KPA info, what they find out from that, that might be something in the future presentation. CDD API, I, but you're KPI, KPI okay. but close enough. Key performance yeah. indicators. I didn't think it sounded right. <laughs> um, CDDIS update maybe at a future meeting. And then as you're thinking about what Don presented today, which was a whole bunch of work around the um, quality bonus and recognition program changes that um, are effective back, uh, I think all of them are retroactive to July 1. Thinking about we'll save a little space as you're thinking about that and as questions come up, that's a great amount of work. So thanks, Don, for leading all of that. And I'm pretty excited about, I do agree that um, Meg, I think I'd put in the chat that it's very responsive to what we've been hearing around um, changes that were wanted. So thanks for that. Is there any other actions or anything else that any updates anyone wants to share? Awesome. Well, thank you all for attending today. Thanks to First Children's Finance and Child Development Division and Anna for updating us. And those of you that shared updates on other um, work that's happening related to the committee. And uh, we'll see you next in October. Thanks, everyone.